Hey everybody, what's up? Matthew here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. Today we're going to take on Nick's question. Thanks for writing, Nick. Nick wants to know what to do because he's discerning a call to the ministry. He just has no idea what God might be calling him to do. <laughs> That's a great question, one that we've all probably thought through a little bit, especially those of us who may have some inclination towards vocational ministry, pastor, missionary, professor at a Christian college, whatever it is, we've all felt that initial tug of the Lord to do something. And by the way, this is not just a question that ordained people need to face, but something that all kinds of Christians need to think about. Is the Lord calling you to do something with your life for the sake of his glory, for the sake of his kingdom, for the sake of his church? And if so, how in the world do you know what God is calling you to do with your life? Well, a great question. and Thank you so much for sending that one in. Something that I had to wrestle with quite a bit when I was a young Christian in my late teens, uh, early 20s, thinking about how the Lord would want to use me in my life. Let me give you a little bit of advice, Nick. Uh, this is just from one who's kind of walked that path and tried a bunch of different things in terms of the ministry myself. First of all, I would say this. Just look and see what holes your current church needs to fill. Probably, if you check the bulletin or you talk to your pastor, what you're going to find out is you already have some things that your church really, really needs. Now, those might not be titles and offices and, you know, a, a, a door with your name on it, that kind of service. But I guarantee you every single church has some real felt needs that you could probably plug into. I'm talking about the nursery. I'm talking about youth group volunteer. I'm talking about someone to do that custodial role that no one wants to do. If you think missions or ministry or pastoral leadership, and you immediately think of those kinds of things that's going to get your name in the bulletin, uh, just set that aside. Maybe, maybe that'll be the case for you, but probably what you need to do is just start serving in those kind of inglorious roles. Uh, maybe the sound team needs you. Again, maybe there's a custodial role for you. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with starting out a ministry career by changing the trash cans out. I'm telling you, uh, one of my friends is a pastor today. He's doing excellent work. He was our custodian, and we supported him as a church, his way through seminary, as he did custodial work for the church. So the first thing I'd say is just ask your pastor what needs to be done. Maybe they need someone on the usher team. Maybe they need someone to supervise next week's bowling outing for the youth group. Whatever it is, just plug in. Start getting your hands dirty with the with the people of God doing the, doing the work of the church, okay? Second thing I would say, Nick, and this is a great question. I love to talk about this. You need to go ahead and try all kinds of different ministries, okay? So maybe if you're a little bit more seasoned, a little bit more mature, it would be a good time for you to teach your first Sunday school class. That's going to put you through the paces of what it takes to actually prepare messages on a daily or weekly basis and then delivering them in front of a, in front of a live audience. Now, it could be that your Sunday school class is very small and uh, you know maybe it's lightly attended, doesn't matter. It could be two, three, four, five people. Yet the diligence that it takes to prepare a message is going to be something that's really going to be challenging to you at first. And even speaking in front of others, even if it's not very many people, is something that you're really going to have to work your way through. So if you feel like maybe it's a pastoral calling, then probably teaching in some small group settings is really the first place that you might consider cutting your teeth. Uh, after that, you might consider... Uh, going on a mission trip or something like that, because you're definitely going to want to explore the possibility that God may call you as some sort of global evangelist. You know, the pastoral life is a beautiful life. Trust me, if I had a thousand lives to live, I would be a pastor in every single one of them because I love serving the church. I love being a pastor. I love preaching multiple times a week or teaching multiple times a week. Um, but think also about God's global work in terms of the Great Commission. You know, the Lord really loves to see his children go out and to fill that Great Commission. Best way to try that, do a short-term mission trip. Get your feet wet with a little bit of uh, third world experience, maybe a little international experience, maybe a little a second language type experiences. That's really going to challenge you. In fact, thinking back on my own career and calling, I was matured, shaped, and sanctified probably more in that six months in Africa uh, end of 1999 all the way up to almost 2000 
when I lived amongst a tribe of people called the Fong people in West Africa, Central West Africa, the country was called Equatorial Guinea. Man, I asked my missionary supervisor, give me the hardest <laughs> spot you have. I probably shouldn't have asked for that because that, that's what they gave me. Equatorial Guinea is ranked almost near the bottom of the United Nations ranking for standard of living. At least it had been for many, many years. I'm not sure what its ranking is right now. But man, I'll tell you what, I was challenged so much. But you know what? Another one of the early a ministry experiences that I had was a little ministry that my church needed me for called Reach Akron. At that time, I was going to a church called The Chapel, a big, beautiful, wonderful, leadership-oriented church, kind of a mega church actually. I did spend some time in a mega church during high school and a little bit of college, of course. Uh, but Reach Akron was a tiny little, very difficult ministry in the city. It was a little um, ministry outpost, let's call it, where there was there was one missionary who kind of lived there, and she was an inner city missionary, and her job was to just care for the children on that particular block. And so on a weeknight, I think it was Tuesday nights, we would take a bunch of college students out there, and we would play games, we would sing songs, we would teach a, like a VBS type message. We even baptized a kid in the drinking fountain, which I probably would not have done now as a ordained Presbyterian minister. I know that would be out of accord with our book of church order for sure in the PCA. But man, wild times of doing inner city ministry with a bunch of kids that just needed to be loved and needed to be cared for, had probably never heard the gospel. A lot of them didn't have dads. And you know what happened, Nick, during my time leading that little Reach Akron program? As there was a certain beautiful young lady who was watching the way that I was interacting with the kids and thought to herself, man, I'd like to marry a guy like that. And that young woman ended up being my wife, Kelly, of 23 years. And so it was uh, those kinds of just getting your hands dirty type of ministry context that not only helped me set a course of trajectory for my life, but also won me a beautiful Christian bride as we got to serve together in the inner city. It was really, really awesome. And then we kind of fell in love on a, another mission trip to Chicago. Our, our uh, college group went out to Chicago and we did more inner city ministry. Uh, I was tearing apart some buildings, rehabbing some things, and she was working with some, some kids in the city of Chicago. That was our first date, and believe it or not, it happened 25 years ago this week. Amazing. So thankful for God's, uh, God's the way that God has organized and just led and directed my life. Okay, so first spot, Nick, I want you to just plug any hole that your church needs. Second, I want you to try all kinds of things. Get involved in a soup kitchen. Get involved in the youth group. Go visit some widows. Definitely want to go check out some of your uh, some of your shut-ins at your church. Go visit them, man. See if you have a little gift of visitation in you. All pastors and ministers and missionaries have to learn how to deal with people and to care for their, their real needs. So go visit a couple of your folks in the hospital. Ask your pastor if you can go on a couple of trips with him next time you have somebody in the hospital. Now, the next thing I want to say, I think this is pretty important too, is you're going to want to ask for some feedback from the people that you've been ministering to. So if you're in a small church, you're going to want to try to take your pastor out for breakfast or lunch and just ask him, say, look, I've been doing this thing for six months now or three months now. You have any feedback on how I'm doing? Am I coming across as shy? Am I coming across as arrogant? Am I a little bit too aggressive? Um, help me out with some of my teaching capabilities. I need you to listen to some of my messages or some of my classes and give me some feedback. Tell me how I could do this a little bit better. Now, probably this is not going to be quite fun because not a lot of us like to hear critique in our lives. We like to hear people tell us that we're good and excellent and strong and beautiful when in reality, the most helpful advice is probably going to be when somebody sanctifies you with a little bit of godly constructive criticism, okay? They're going to show you some things about yourself that you can't necessarily see, okay? That's why we call them blind spots because we, some of us, we can't see our own weaknesses. So if, you, if your church is too large and you can't get any face time with your pastor, then maybe ask a few other Christians that are wiser and older than you. If you have some elders, of course, I would definitely go there. Maybe one of the deacons of your church. Maybe just some of your friends. You can sit down and say, hey, how am I doing? And give me some real honest feedback here because I really need to know. Okay. So after that, you may then consider that if God is pulling you in one direction rather than the other, let's say you've tried a little bit of visitation, you've tried, you've gone on a mission trip, you did a little bit of inner city stuff, you've tried some teaching, maybe even your, if your church lets you preach, who knows, your pastor may let you do that. That may be what God uses to pull you in a particular direction. After that, Nick, you're going to want to seriously consider this question. Where do I need to go to get trained to do what God 
seems to be calling me to do. Now, a lot of young people, they're going to want to skip over that. Okay. They're going to want to go the Spurgeon route and they're going to say, Hey, Spurgeon didn't go to college. Yeah, I know that, but he was Spurgeon. Okay. They're going to say, well, John Bunyan was a tinker. He didn't go to college. I know he's extraordinary, but a lot of us, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to get some formal training for the ministry. That means Christian college, or perhaps that means seminary. If you're applicable for that, and if so, let me just recommend to anybody out there that might be considering seminary, I would say go to RPTS, the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Pittsburgh. Uh, they have online programs. They have in-person programs. It's a wonderful, doctrinally solid expression of a, a wonderful, a strong, but small seminary. Uh, the motto there is uh, train under pastors, which I, I love that. All the professors there are, are skilled experienced pastors, but also equally uh, wise in terms of their academic credentialing and all that kind of thing. So you might want to think about where to go to school. That's just one tip that I would say. And listen, if the kind of ministry that you're talking about isn't necessarily full-time pastoral vocational type ministry, then of course seminary may not be necessary for you. But you still want to be the sharpest tool that you possibly can be right? If you're going to be an axe, the axe in the hand of the great lumberjack, you want to be a sharp axe. So you might as well get some kind of training. So you're going to want to think about that that too. All right, Nick. Well, hopefully I gave you some good ideas for your, uh, your pursuit of your call. I definitely commend you on trying to answer the Lord's call. You know, there's that beautiful passage in Isaiah chapter six, where uh, he says, here I am. And hopefully that's the cry of your heart, your heart too, that you would be one who says to the Lord, here I am, send me. Thanks for checking into this video. Love you lots. Talk to you later.